Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and in the course Enzyme Science and Technology, we are discussing about the different aspects of the enzymes and in this context, uh, in the previous module, we have discussed about the historical development of the field of enzyme which is called as enzymology and then we have also discussed about the classification of the enzymes in the different groups. So, what we have discussed, we have discussed that the enzymes are being classified into the different group based on the uh, detailed criteria which we have, which the enzyme commission has adopted. And then subsequent to that, we have also discussed about the enzyme nomenclature and we have taken an example of each class, how we can be able to give the name of that enzymes. And uh, in the today's lecture or in this particular module, we are going to discuss about the enzyme structures. You know that the enzyme is catalyzing a uh, reactions, right? It is converting the substrate into the product and it is very, very crucial that the enzyme is recognizing the substrate and most of the substrates are having the three dimensional conformations. So, enzyme also has to adopt the uh, a suitable three dimensional conformation so that it can be able to recognize the substrate, it can be able to uh, perform the reactions and that is how it can be able to conform, convert the substrate into the product. So, if we if we see the enzyme, right, the enzyme are actually being uh, central molecules and they are also being called as the biological catalyst. What they are doing, they are converting the substrate into the product, right? And in this process, they are actually not changing the uh, speed, right? They are not being uh, consumed, right? And enzymes in general are made up of, of the proteins, but there are exceptions where the enzymes are also being made up of, of the RNA molecules and these enzymes are called as the ribozymes and ribozymes are involved in a, in a very, very crucial process that is called as the splicing where they are actually removing the introns from the exons. So, that process anyway we are going to take up when we are going to discuss about the enzyme applications. In today's lecture, an enzyme is processing the substrate into generating the product because the substrate is having the required 3D conformations, right? And these 3D conformations are actually going to be identified by the 3D conformations of the enzyme. If you recall in the previous module, we have discussed how the enzymes are recognizing the substrate and how they are actually utilizing the different types of properties. So, they are having had geometrical constraints, they are going to have the stereochemical constraint and then they are also going to have the functional groups which are responsible for the substrate recognition and as well as the conversion of substrate into the product. Now, as far as the enzyme structure is concerned, enzymes are actually having the detailed structure, okay? And if you see the enzyme structure, the enzyme structure is the ordered folding of the polypeptide chain that gives rise to the 3D conformation known as the secondary structure of the proteins such as the helix, beta sheets and loops. And the arrangement of the secondary structure give rise to the tertiary structures, right? So, this is the primary structure where you have the chain of the amino acids, these primary structures when they fold, they are actually going to give you the secondary structures and within the secondary structure, we have the alpha helices, we have beta sheets and we have the turns. And then when these secondary structures uh, are actually uh, connected by the unstructured loops to arrange themselves in a protein structure, it allows the secondary structure to change their directions. And the tertiary structures define the function of a protein, enzymatic activity or the nature of a structural protein. So, these secondary structures, uh, they are being connected with the help of the unstructured loop and that is how they are actually going to be converted into the tertiary structures. 
and shrift structures are actually going to be fold into the quaternary structure in those cases where the protein is having the more number of subunits. So, as far as as such, the enzyme has the different types of secondary structure, different types of structural levels. It has the primary structures, it has secondary structure, it has tertiary structure, and in some cases, when the protein has the multiple uh, polypeptide chains, then it also going to have the quaternary structure. So, let us start the discussing about the primary structures. So, primary structure is nothing but the sequence of the polypeptide chain. So, enzyme, so as I said, you know, enzyme could be the made up of, of the RNA molecules or enzyme could be made up of, of the proteins. Mostly the enzymes, uh, more than 99% uh, enzymes molecules are made up of, of the protein molecules and there are a very small fraction of the enzymes which are made up of, of the RNA molecules and these enzymes are called as the ribozyme, right. So, we will not going to discuss about the ribozyme in this particular course. So, enzyme is made up of, of the proteins and the proteins are actually the polymer of the amino acids which are joined by a covalent bond known as the peptide bond. And the, each protein can be broken into the constituent amino acid by a variety of method to study the free amino acids. There are 20 different types of amino acids which are present in the protein. So, what you see here is this is the general structure of uh, pro amino acids where you have a central carbon and it, this is called as the alpha carbon and around this central carbon you have the carboxyl group right and you have the amino group. So, it is connected to the one side it is connected to the carboxyl group on the side it is connected to the amino group and on one side it is connected to the hydrogen and then in the fourth side it is connected to a functional group that is called also the side chain. And because of this the alpha carbon is a chiral center and, uh, and that is why the amino acids actually can be able to exhibit the isomerism, isomerizations. So, it can actually be adopt the different types of conformation around the alpha carbons. So, amino acids are classified by the R group, but people have started discovering these amino acids. They have given the name based on the food sources from which they have been isolated for the first time. For example, the asparagine, asparagine was isolated from the asparagus, okay. And, say, and the glutamate is isolated from the wheat gluten, whereas the tyrosine is isolated from the cheese and in the Greek the tyros means the cheese, that is why the, the name of the amino acid is tyrosine. Similarly, the glycine, glycine is derived for its name due to its sweet taste because in the Greek uh, you have the glycose which is called as the sweet. So, this, these are the conventional name which are being given, but uh, later on people have started giving the name based on the uh, systematic uh, scientific uh, way of doing it and that is how they have given these kind of names. Uh, as I said, you know remembering these single letter code or the triple letter code is very important because when we are going to write the sequence of the amino acids or for a particular protein, uh, you cannot write the full name, right? And that is why these single letter or the triple letter codes are being used in that particular cases. Now, the uh, amino acids are, as I said, you know, amino acids are classified based on the R group. So, we have the 20 different uh, amino acids and all these amino acids are varying in terms of the different types of properties. So, what you see here is I have given you a composite table where I have given you the three letter codes or the single letter code. Then uh, as far as the molecular weight is concerned, the molecular weight is also depending on the side chain as well as the other groups. So, the, you can see that the molecular weight is 89 in the case of alanine, whereas it uh, molecular weight is 204 in the case of tryptophan. So, it actually varies a lot, but on a generalized way, the amino acid uh, molecular weight is considered to be uh, 110 Dalton, okay, uh, Dalton. 
So, if I if I say if, if there will be a question right that uh, uh, what will be the uh, how many amino acids are present in a 20 kda protein ok. So, if this is a generalized uh, uh, question what you can do is uh, the number of amino acid if you want to calculate then what I will do is I will just take the uh, 20,000 kda, uh, 20,000 Dalton and I will divide that by 110 and then what you are going to get is you are going to get the number of amino acid. So, that uh, is a generalized term. If I say ok, uh, you should calculate the, uh, the number of amino acids present in the actin protein uh, then um, uh, and if I give you a sequence of that amino acid or the sequence of that particular protein then the uh, or if I say ok I give you a sequence of the amino actin protein or you give me the molecular weight then in that case the situation is going to be different. Then you, what you have to do is you have to first count the number of uh, amino acids right. For example, if I say number of glycines so suppose the number of glycines are 10 right for example. So, you can just go with the glycine table right and then you say oh glycine's uh, molecular weight is 75. So, 75 into 10 is 750 Dalton and that is how you are actually going to do for the calculations. You are going to calculate the number of other amino acids like the how many aspartates are present, how many uh, arginines are present, how many lysines are present, how many tryptophans are present and then you just keep multiplying like that and if you add all those numbers. Uh, then it is actually going to tell you that what is the molecular weight of the actin proteins. So, this is just a generalized term right. So, this is the molecular formula what is being given uh, for each and every amino acid then it is the residue formula what is given and then you have the uh, residue weight which is may like you if you remove the water molecule then this is going to be the, uh, the molecular weight. Then it is also giving you the pK values and if the amino acid has the uh, two functional group then it is also going to give you the pkb as well and uh, it is also going to give you the pi value. So, these pk values are actually going to calculate uh, used to calculate the charge on that particular amino acids whereas, the pi is actually going to calculate uh, the charge. So, it is going to uh, let you to calculate the charge of that particular amino acids at that particular uh, pH. So, in a particular pH, so you know that at that particular pH the amino acid is going to be neutral. So, okay. Now, the uh, amino acids are classified by the R groups. So, you can have the uh, different types of R groups. You can have the non-polar aliphatic R groups. So, the R group in this amino acids are non-polar and the hydrophobic examples includes are the alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, glycine, methionine and proline. Then we have the aromatic R groups which means these are the groups where you going to have a benzene ring. So, these groups are going to be contain the benzene ring whereas, in this case it is not going to contain the benzene ring it is going to be a linear chain. So, the R group in these groups are hydrophobic side chains for example, uh, the phenylalanine tyrosine and the tryptophan right. So, you might have to remember the structure of these amino acids if you want to understand the, uh, the functional role or the crucial role going to be played by these amino acids. Then we have the polar uncharged groups which means these amino acids are not going to have the charge which means they are not going to be positive or negative charges but they are polar in nature. So, the R group in these amino acids are uncharged and they are more polar than the hydrophobic amino acids. Example includes are serine, threonine, cysteine, asparagine and the glutamine. Then we have the negatively charged R groups which means they are actually going to be uh, called as the acidic amino acid uh, because they are actually going to impart the negative charge into the protein. So, the R group in these amino acids are acidic with the net negative charge examples are the aspartate and the glutamate. Then we have the positively charged R groups and these amino acids are called as the basic amino acids. Uh, they are actually going to give you the positive charges and the R group in these amino acids are basic with the net positive charges. Examples includes are the arginine and the lysine.
Now, when you take a protein and you want to calculate, you want to know what will be the amino acids are present, what you can do is you can just do a acid hydrolysis and if you do the acid hydrolysis, it is actually going to give you the mixture of amino acids, right. Now, once you have the mixture of amino acid, you can resolve these amino acids onto a thin layer chromatography. So, thin layer chromatography is a technique which actually is going to give you the spot for the each and every individual amino acids and depending on the intensity of that particular amino acid and depending on the number of spots what you are going to get from this particular protein, you can be able to calculate the number of amino acid as well as the uh, different uh, the type of amino acids present in that particular mixture. So, that you are going to do when you are going to analyze the amino acids. So, how you are going to do the analysis of the amino acids? The thin layer chromatography technique is an analytical chromatography to separate and analyze the amino acids from the protein. In this method, the silica or the alumina, alumina as a stationary factor, a stationary phase is coated onto a glass or the aluminum foil as a thin layer and then a sample is allowed to run in the presence of the mobile phase. In comparison to other chromatography technique, the mobile phase runs from the bottom to top from the, by the diffusion, whereas in most of the chromatography technique, the mobile phase runs from the top to bottom by the gravity. So, what you are going to do is you are going to take a thin aluminum uh, uh, foil right and on or the glass plates and then in this aluminum foil you are actually going to make a thin film of the alumina or the silica right and then what you are going to do is you are going to apply your amino acid which you want to dissolve right and then you are going to keep this into a solvent system. So, once the solvent is going to run in from the uh, from the uh, bottom to top, it is actually going to take up the your amino acid also along with that and then it is actually going to give you the spot as per the and it is going to give you the mixture of the amino acid and that is how it is actually going to resolve. Now, what you see here is in the TLC, you are going to have the movement of the solvent from the bottom to top because of the diffusion. Compared to that in a conventional chromatography, you are going to see always running of the mobile phase from the top to bottom. For example, if you run a column, right, the column you run from the water from top to bottom, whereas in the case of thin layer chromatography, the solvent runs from the top to bottom uh, because of the uh, diffusion. As sample runs along with the mobile phase, it get distributed into the solvent phase and the stationary phase, right. When it runs, it is actually going to be, uh, you know, uh, going to get distributed. So, either it will go with the solvent fronts, right. So, you can see that all the solvent molecules are running, right. So, either, so if this is the molecule, either it will go along with the solvent front or it will actually going to remain with the silica front right and because of that it is actually going to be distributed because that kind of affinity and that kind of differential behavior is going to be different for the different amino acid molecules. The interaction of the sample with the stationary phase retard the movement of the molecule whereas the mobile phase implies and the uh, as the effective force. So, what will happen is that when you are going to apply the sample onto this it is actually going to uh, experience, for example, this spot, right. So, if you have a spot here, it is going to experience two different types of forces. It is going to have a uh, uh, driving force, right. So, it dri driving force is actually going to be exerted by the solvent molecule. So, solvent molecule is going to try to push this molecule towards the top side because it is running, right. But whereas it is actually going to make the interaction with the uh, these uh, silica particles which are present on the this uh, TLC plate and because of that there will be a retardation forces. So, that retardation forces is going to be by the matrix molecule and because of that it is going to have the two opposite forces. One which is going to be uh, on towards the top side and the other one is going to be on to the bottom side. So, it is going to be distributed so and it is going to be immobilized onto the plate. Now, suppose the force caused by the mobile phase is Fm 
and the retardation force by the stationary phase is Fs. So, then the effective force on the molecule will be Fm minus Fs. So, this is what I am going to I was trying to explain you right. So, if this is the spot on this spot you are going to have the upward forces which is called as Fm or the mobile force by the mobile phase whereas it is actually going to have the retardation forces which is going to be caused by the stationary phase which is called as the Fs. So, this molecule is actually going to run effectively by a force which is going to be Fm minus Fs. Now, the the uh, Fm minus F1, uh, so where this molecule is going to be stopped, right? It is going to stop the place where the Fm is going to be equivalent to Fs, right? And that Fm minus Fs is going to be different for the different molecule and that is why they are actually going to be present at the different places. For example, for this molecule, the Fm is too big for the Fs, which means it is still having a uh, effective uh, charge at this point and that is why the, the this molecule runs for the longer period of time. But at this point when it got immobilized again for this one also the Fm is equivalent to Fs. So, the molecule is immobilized on the silica gel where the Fm is going to be equivalent to the Fs and the position is controlled by the multiple factors nature or the functional group what is present onto the molecule or the analyte. So, if the molecule is going to interact with or suppose it has the functional group and it is going to interact with the silica particle then it is actually going to increase the Fs. If it is going to increase the Fs then the Fm minus Fs is going to be small right and if this is the case then it is actually going to be immobilized towards the uh, spotting points. Then it is also going to be depend on the nature on the composition of the mobile phase. So, depending on the mobile phase also it is actually going to be different right. If the mobile if the molecule is very soluble into the mobile phase then the Fm the value of Fm forces are actually going to go up right and uh, that is why the, it is actually going to run very far away from the spotting uh, place right. Then it also depends on to the thickness of the stationary phase because that also is going to have the effect on to the retardation forces and then it also has a functional group. So, functional group what is present on to the stationary phase. So, apart from the functional group what is present on to the analyte molecule, the functional group if the functional groups are also present on to the, uh, the silica particles like for example, if you take the uh, silica particle or if you take the functionized silica particle they may have the higher affinity for this particular molecule and as a result the Fs will actually go up and if the Fs will go up it is going the Fm minus Fs is going to be small and that is why it is actually going to immobilize uh, very soon uh, and it is going to be closer to the spotting points. So, you can imagine that if I want to see the differences like what I can do is uh, or if I want to know where the molecule is going to immobilize, what I can do is once it got immobilized, I can take a distance from this molecule to the origin. So, this is the origin point. So, for example, it, at this point, I have started putting the spot of the mixture and then the solvent started running, right? So, solvent, when the solvent reached to the end of the uh, plate or it reaches to at least the 75 percent, uh, then what I can do is I can just stop this, I can develop this spot and then I will calculate the distances what is run by the solvent and I can also calculate the distances run by the individual spot. So, for example, this is the spot number 1, this is the spot number 2, this is the spot number 3 and the distance of the spot number 1 is D1, the distance of the spot number 2 is D2 and the distance of the spot number 3 is D3. So, what I can do is I can just calculate the RF values and RF value what is the formula is that the distance of the um, uh, analyte right distance of the analyte spot which is like D in this case. So, dx divided by the distance of the solvent. So, distance of solvent like the in this case ds. Okay. And this is going to be fractional. So, the maximum RF what is possible is 1 
and it's going to be the fraction of 1, right? Because this is a ratio, right? And this RF value is going to be dependent onto the uh, onto the solvent system, right? De de depending on the, the solvent what you have taken, depending on the matrix material and depending on the conditions in which it is run. So, if you are going to maintain all the three constant, right? If you maintain the same solvent system, if you maintain the same matrix and if you run it under the identical conditions, the RF value is not going to be changed. Even if you run it for, for example, if I run it for 50 centimeter, uh, it is going to be distributed accordingly. So that for example, if I have RF value of 0.5, okay. So if I run it for 50 centimeter, the spot is going to be formed as 20 centimeter, 25 centimeter. If I run it on 100 centimeter, right, then uh, the spot is going to be formed at 50 centimeter because it is going to maintain the ratio of RF is equal to 0.5. So, if I RF is 0.5 which means the ratio of dx to ds is going to be 0 0.5. So, uh, so that that uh, that does not depends on the how much length you are going to run the TLC plates. It is going to be always be immobilized at the 50 percent distance, right, if the RF value is 0 0.5. So, this RF value is constant and that is why the RF value can be used to characterize the different types of amino acids. Now, the question comes how you can be able to determine the RF values. You can actually be able to run the TLC plate uh, that uh, you can be able to run the th thin layer chromatography and that is how you can be able to calculate. So, how you can actually be able to run the thin layer chromatography? Uh, several steps are required to perform a thin layer chromatography to analyze the complex sample. These preparative and operational steps are as follows. So, in the step number one, you are actually going to make the spotting. But before that, you are actually first going to take a thin layer plate. So, what you see here is this is the thin uh, TLC plate, right? So, what you are going to do is what you take the TLC plate, you uh, cut the TLC plate as per the number of sample what you are going to place right on the width wise and its height is also going to be as per the chamber of your TLC plate right. So, you are going to run it in a chamber right and then what you are going to do is you are going to take a scale and you are going to put a line and this line should be above to the solvent front right because it is going to dip right ultimately it's, you are going to dip this. So, then you put a line and then on this line you are actually going to put the spots. So, the line is drawn with a pencil little away from the bottom. The sample is taken into the capillary tube or in a pipette. So, what you can do is just take the sample into a capillary tube. The capillary is touched onto the silica plate and sample is allowed to dispense. So, what will happen is when you touch the silica uh, when you touch the capillary to the that particular silica, it is actually going to suck the uh, sample uh, automatically by the action of diffusion, right. So, it is important that the depending on the thickness of the layer, a suitable volume should be applied. Spot is allowed to dry in air or a hair dryer can be used instead. Then we have the running of the TLC. So, once the spot is dried, it is placed in the TLC chamber in such a way that the spot should not be below to the solvent level. Solvent level front is allowed to move until the end of the plate. So, uh, what you can going to do is just keep it into a TLC chamber. So, you can actually be able to develop a TLC chamber into a beaker or into a thin uh, small chamber it's depending on the type of the uh, solvent right. So, we would then you have to cover this with a some uh, you know uh, with the lid right other you can just put a cap right and why it is important because so that the solvent what you have put is actually going to form the vapor and that vapor should be condensed otherwise it is not going to give you a uh, upward movement. After the, uh, so then you are going to place the TLC into this, right? So, you are going to plate the TLC plate and make sure that this line should be above to the solvent front so that it is not going to get dissolved into this solvent before running, right? Uh, 
the analysis of the chromatography plate. The plate is taken out from the chamber and air dried. If the compound is colored, it forms the spot and these, these substances, there is a no additional staining required. There are two methods of developing a chromatogram. So, what you can do is uh, later on you can just take out this uh, plate and then you air dry. So, if the uh, analytes like the, uh, the amino acids are colored, then actually they are going to give you a spot and then you can directly take the all the sort of measurements. So, you can actually know that this is the uh, like the DS, right? So, this is the solvent what you have run and then you can just take the calculation of this and it is actually going to be DX and then you can actually be able to calculate the RF value by DX by the DS. So, for this the position of the spot is very important, right? So, if it is colored compound, there is no need to have the any kind of additional uh, staining procedures or any kind of procedures, you can actually be able to do this, right? But if it is not, then you have to go with the staining procedures. In the staining procedure, the TLC plate is sprayed with a staining reagent to stain the functional group what is present into the compound. For example, the ninhydrin is used to stain the amino acids. So, if it is not, then you can actually be able to use the staining procedures. If you want, you can actually go with the non-staining procedure as well. So, you, you can use the non-staining procedure. In the non-staining procedure, a spot can be identified by the following method. You can use the autoradiography. A TLC plate can be placed along with the X-ray film for 48 to 72 hours. Uh, Exposure time depends on the time and the concentration of the radioactivity and then the X-ray film is processed. So, you can actually have the radioactive amino acids and that is actually going to be exposed to the X-ray film and then it is actually going to give you the spot onto the X-ray film and then you can do all the calculations from this particular spot. Right? For example, you can do the RF calculations, you can actually do the DX and DS and that is why you are actually going to get the RF values so, and that RF value can use for identification of that particular unknown spots. The second is you can do the fluorescence. So, several heterocyclic compound gives the fluorescence in UV due to the presence of conjugate double bound system. TLC plate can be visualized in the UV chamber to identify the spot. So, what you see here is this is the typical UV chamber where you have the uh, UV bulbs and uh, this is the chamber right this is the this is the uh, lid of that particular chamber so what you can do is just open from here and place the plates under this and then you can just turn on the uv lights so you can have the two different types of uv lights uh, which you can use as per the wavelength and uh, then from this size because the uv light is dangerous for the eye so that's why you can actually be able to observe not directly but through this particular sp uh, uh, spotting uh, observing window and uh, what you see here is that uh, uh, this uh, all the spots are visible right so under the uv and then you can actually be able to use the camera or some other uh, uh, acquisition uh, system and that's how you can actually be able to capture the image apart from that uh, you can also use the uh, iodine so you can also use the iodine staining right so uh, you can actually be able to uh, incubate the TLC plate into the iodine chamber and this iodine chamber is actually going to stain the um, uh, spots as well. So, the proteins are as, as, as we discussed that right, proteins are the polymer of the amino acid. They are joined by the covalent bond known as the peptide bond. A peptide bond is formed between the carboxyl group of the first and the amino group of the second amino acid with the release of the water molecule. So, this is you will see that this is the uh, amino acid number 1 and this is the amino acid number 2. So, when they will go by with the uh, condensation reactions. So, what will happen is that the OH of this acid and the H from this is actually going to combine and that is why there will be a bond which is going to be formed uh, between the two amino acids and that is how there will be a loss of water and this is a dehydration reaction. So, it is a dehydration synthesis or the condensation reactions. The peptide bond has partial double bond character due to the resonance and the CN bond is not free to rotate. But the bond between the N to alpha like the N to the alpha and the C to C alpha can be able to rotate through a dry handle angle designated by the phi and psi. So, 
what you can uh, so this peptide bond is uh, rigid it is not allowed to rotate but the bond with the the and the uh, but the uh, the uh, bond between the n to alpha and the c to c alpha can be able to rotate through the dry headed angle which are designated as the phi and psi and these angle can be able to rotate from the minus 180 to plus 180 with the few restrictions uh, to exploit this particular type of phenomena the indian scientist uh, g n ramchandran has determined the possible uh, phi and psi angles for a particular amino acid by synthesizing the tripeptide with the amino acid of interest in the middle. So, what he has done is he has actually synthesized a, a tripeptide. So, for example, if it, he wants to calculate the phi and psi angle for A, he has, uh, he has made a tripeptide with C and B. So, you can keep changing these uh, tripeptide and that is how you can be able to calculate under different uh, conditions what will be the different sci-fi angles are possible and that is how you can be able to make a map between the psi versus phi right. So, you can actually be able to make a angle between the map between the psi and phi and then you can calculate that under different combinations how much these psi and phi angle are going to vary for the A molecule and that is how you can say that okay A will go from this psi angle to this phi angle. And based on that, he has actually developed a map which is called as the Ramchandran plot. And that Ramchandran plot is used to define the region of the allowed rotation for the amino acid present in a protein structure. And he, what he proposed is that he, you can use this particular type of plot to say whether a whether a salt protein structure is correct or wrong because if it is incorrect then the psi and phi angle are not going to be present in that particular defined region right. So, that is what you see here is that you are actually going to see the different regions and it is going to be uh, what you see here is the plot between the psi and phi and uh, that shows the location of the different types of structures what is present in the protein structures and so on and uh, that is how it is actually going to give you the distribution of that particular amino acid in the protein structures and how much its uh, phi and psi angle are going to vary. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about that the enzymes are made up of, of the either the protein molecules or the RNA molecule. Majorly enzymes are made up of, of the protein molecules whereas there is a small fraction of the enzymes which are been made up of, of the RNA molecules and these enzymes are called as the ribozymes. So, in this case, uh, in this particular course, we are not discussing about the ribozymes and then the proteins are made up of, of the 20 different types of amino acids. These amino acids share a common structural feature so that they have the central C alpha carbon. The C alpha carbon is attached to the amino group on one side, carboxyl group on the other side and then it is group attached to the different types of functional groups and based on these functional groups the amino acid could be of different types. So, we have 20 different amino acids what is present in the uh, protein structures and we have discussed how the uh, different side chains are actually going to be responsible for providing the different types of properties into the amino acids and you can be able to generate the amino acids from the protein so that you can be able to study the different types of amino acids what are present in the proteins and, uh, and, and how you can be able to exploit the thin layer chromatography to study the amino acids which are present in the enzyme structures. This is what we have discussed in our subsequent lecture we are actually going to discuss about how you can be able to determine the primary structures ok. So, determination of the primary structure is a very very important aspect to understand how you can be able to know the primary structures. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the determination of the primary structure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.